Oh yeah, <laughs> the ambassador, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Officially announced. Fine. Yeah. yeah, that would be. But still, it's hot here. I have lunch with uh, Charles today. So ah, you found you. Gamu itane na irosa ishari gapsi lebule bari. Well, I don't need us to be able to sit with us with the organizer, we have to get into this. So, I saw a queer. Mere, I know, all this with 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 Sadarian is Halkir. I said, I don't know. Oh, excuse me. Hello, hello everybody. I'm really uh, delighted uh, to host today our distinguished guests and to host you, to host all of you. Uh, special greetings to their excellencies who joined our uh, discussion today. Uh, we are today at uh, the Romi University campus, who, which houses two universities, Free University and Agricultural University. And we worked very hard with Nino uh, to make uh, this event happen, and to, we are really grateful to her and her organization. Uh, and uh, I firstly ask uh, Nino to, to give you a flavor so uh, under which umbrella this uh, discussion uh, is taking place. Thank you so much. I'm Nino Evgenidze, Executive Director of Economy Policy Research Center, and our organization, together with the Stanford University Center of Democracy Development and Rule of Law, uh, organized the International Leadership Forum in Georgia during the three days to discuss modern state building issues and especially Georgian case. Uh, we think that the Georgia is a unique case for post-Soviet and also for the world to transfer our like uh, reformed experience and uh, our like uh, uh, achievements. And for this regard, I was a Stanford fellow for last years and uh, we convinced Mr. <laughs> Francis Fukuyama and uh, Eric Jensen to come in Georgia and to discuss this very uh, painful and challenging issues with us. And we are happy to have them. And uh, let's welcome 
Dr. Francis Fukuyama and Eric Jensen on our board. <laughs> and also I would like to say that underlined this, uh, uh, this project was uh, like uh, with great support of US Embassy of Georgia, Open Society Georgia Foundation and Bank of Georgia University and we're thankful for them to happening and to implementing this great project. Thank you so much. Thank you, and uh, in addition to Nina's uh, introduction and uh, welcome, so I would like to announce that um, Free University decided to award uh, Dr. Francis Fukuyama and Dr. Ernest, uh, Eric Jensen title of Distinguished Professors of our university, and uh, I'll ask uh, our Rector, Mr. Chikowani, to hand over the, uh, the uh, how to diploma and uh, the, the small signage for, for this distinguishment. Well, on behalf of the Free University, I'm honored to address, to award the uh, distinguished professor's degree to our distinguished professors, so I have the opportunity to congratulate you now. So um, I think uh, I, I cut short the biographies of, of uh, our distinguished professors because I, I think it's better to, to, to go right to the content of, of our meeting. Uh, but before doing that, so I would like to welcome Dr. Gia Nodia, uh, who really uh, worked with us to, to, to master this, this event and we are really grateful and thankful that he is one of the discussants of uh, our today's event. And uh, before I, I, I leave this, this uh, floor, so I would like to uh, welcome and introduce Dr. Tamara Kovzirizze, professor of Free University, who will be moderating uh, today's discussion and I would like to pass the floor to her. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Vato. Um, so uh, now we will move um, to the um, uh, analytical part um, of, uh, of our event. Um, and as you know, we have a, a very interesting topic ahead of us. 
which um, we want to discuss with you, and that is uh, democracy and state building in the post-Soviet space. And we will talk uh, primarily about Georgia as a case, but also compare it um, with uh, other countries um, in, our, um, in our region. Now, before I move to introducing the topic, I actually uh, want to briefly uh, say something about our very distinguished panelists. So uh, we have three panelists today. Um, Dr. Francis Fukuyama, uh, who is um, actually very famous in Georgia, and we use um, his books and writings uh, to educate um, our students at various universities. Um, and I think if there was someone who didn't know Francis Fukuyama so far, I think by today uh, you are very well known because since you arrived, you have been on TV every day <laughs> in prime time in the headlines. <laughs> so. Um, let me welcome you um, in particular. Um, Dr. Francis Fukuyama is a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute of, uh, for International Studies and a resident at uh, that institute center uh, on democracy, development, and the rule of law. And before joining Stanford, uh, Mr. Fukuyama was professor uh, of international political economy at the School of Advanced International Studies of the Johns Hopkins University. Um, it actually, it is not the first time for Mr. Fukuyama to be in Georgia, as far as I know. So you have been here before in the 80s. Um, I think this uh, three-day visit has been um, very loaded uh, with events and probably with experiences. So we would be very much interested to um, uh, learn what are your impressions and insights um, after this um, visit to Georgia. Our uh, second... Um, very distinguished panelist is Mr. Eric Jensen, uh, who is a professor at Stanford uh, Law School and director of the Law School's Rule of Law Program and an affiliated faculty member at the Center on, on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law um, at the Institute for International Studies at the Stanford University. Mr. Jensen was trained in uh, Great Britain and United States. He has a large number of uh, publications uh, on about 30 different countries and their uh, legal and development aspects, and he has 25 years of experience of research, uh, practice, and uh, teaching. Uh, our third panelist um, is actually our frequent guest, <laughs> Mr. Gia Nodia, who is obviously not uh, for the first time to speak at our university. Um, Gia is a political scientist and a political analyst. Um, as most of you know, he's uh, currently director of the International School of Caucasus Studies at the Ilia University. Uh, and Gia is actually founder and director, one of the, probably one of the first think tanks um, in Georgia. This is the Caucasus Institute for Peace, Democracy, and Development. Gia was minister of education in 2008. He has a uh, very rich teaching and research experience at various universities in Georgia, but also abroad, including uh, Western Europe and uh, United States. So with this, uh, let me uh, move to our um, topic today. As I outlined earlier, the, the topic is democracy and state building in the post-Soviet space. Um, so as you noticed, we will talk about democracy and state building, and we will try to see to what extent these two things are um, always compatible, to what extent they develop in parallel, or whether there are cases uh, where maybe one constrains uh, the other. Um, there appears actually to be a paradox in relation um, between democratization and state building. And if we look at democracies in the world, in a typical case, probably a democracy, a liberal democracy is characterized by very strong, well-developed and accountable institutions. And democracies can provide high, highest level of uh, protection of individual freedoms and civil liberties to their citizens, but they also provide a better level of uh, economic development uh, and performance if they are compared uh, to autocratic regimes. However, if we look at some countries um, in our region in particular, countries in transition, it is not so obvious that democracy and state building are developed in parallel and one necessarily encourages uh, the development of the other. Um, 
after the breakup of the Soviet Union, Georgia and many other countries in our region were characterized by the so-called double failure. So failure of statehood and failure of um, uh, democratic development. That situation changed in some countries to some extent, but not in all of them. A uh, situation changed quite dramatically um, uh, in Georgia. And uh, in the past 10 years, it has uh, seen a substantial transformation uh, and strengthening of institutions. But there are sometimes still is a perception that institutional development and development of stateness in Georgia saw uh, a, a stronger track record than development of democracy. So uh, using Georgia's example, we will talk about um, the, the question that I um, outlined initially and try to see um, to what extent democratization and state building are always related. Now, before I turn the floor to our um, uh, speakers, uh, I would like to uh, very briefly sketch the context in which Georgia's development is taking place because I think it is always important to place a case within a context and I think there are certain specific characteristics um, that we have to take into account when we discuss stateness and democracy in Georgia. Uh, first of all, um, probably we have to say that if we regard democratic development as something positive in our region, this is certainly a luxury. So this is an exception rather than a rule. So more countries around us are probably not clearly democratic than democratic, right? So very few countries would qualify as a true democracy. Second, in most countries of the region, a strong state is associated um, not necessarily with the same understanding of strong institutions uh, uh, as you would have it in a Western type liberal democracy, but strong state is associated with authoritarian rule or authoritarian leader. And on the contrary, democracy is often perceived as a weakness. So it is often perceived that uh, if you want to have a strong uh, state, you cannot have a democratic um, rule at the same time. Uh, Third, um, in a typical case in our region, uh, and Georgia is an example of that as well, if you try to be democratic, you have to pay a price for that. And actually the price can go as high as you can imagine. It can cost you part of your territory, which is occupied militarily, or part of your territory is simply forcefully annexed, right? So uh, Georgia and Ukraine are good ca cases in point here, and I think we will talk more about that uh, in a minute. Uh, fourth, uh, it is very typical um, in most of the countries in our region that actually when democratic development and institution building takes place, third powers, and uh, most importantly I mean Russia here, interfere, meddle uh, into the internal electoral or institutional processes. So this third party intervention through encouraging certain political forces is also very typical here. And fifth and last, and I will finish with that, democratic development here is very much coupled with Western integration as a foreign policy priority. And as we move forward, we see less and less countries in the region which uh, still have this very clearly expressed um, Western or European integration as their goal. So in those countries which still strive to do that, the desire to build a liberal democracy is definitely stronger. It is either a desire that comes on its own or it is um, a precondition for their further integration into the West. So more democracy um, is a condition for, for more integration. So this is uh, very briefly um, like a, an overall picture which might seem somewhat grim to you, but <laughs> we will see to what extent that is true and how that applies. So with this, I would um, very much like to invite our distinguished panelists, and um, I would ask uh, each of them to make an intervention of about um, 10, 15 minutes, and then we will have uh, time for your questions, and I hope we will have a very lively discussion. So Mr. Fukuyama, please. Thank you very much. It's really a great pleasure to, uh, to be here. Uh, 
I have a couple of connections with this university. I've been a friend and colleague of Kaka Bendikidze for several years because we are both on the board of the RAND Graduate School in California. And of course, I've known uh, Gia Nodia for many years uh, uh, as a fellow uh, scholar and academic. So um, thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, the topic about um, the potential tension between uh, state building and democracy is one that I've been completely preoccupied with. I'm going to publish a book, uh, the second volume in the series I've been writing on political development, which is called Political Order and Political Decay. It'll come out in English uh, in October, and that's actually one of the central issues of the book. So I will actually give you a preview of some of the argue arguments that I make. Uh, so there are three areas I want to point to where there is a potential or a real conflict between democracy and state building. Uh, the first has to do with uh, patronage or clientelism. Second has to do with security, citizen security. Uh, and the third has to do with the formation of national identity. And in all three of these cases, uh, there is a problem that uh, building effective modern states uh, gets in the way of uh, democratic control of political institutions. But I want to also point out the ways in which that conflict is not necessary, uh, and then to try to relate it a little bit to uh, the situation as, I've, as I see it uh, here in Georgia. So let me move through these three uh, areas. Let's begin with the, the problem of clientelism. This is patron-client relationships, which are almost universal, and I think in many developing and transitional co uh, countries has been a particular problem in weakening the quality of, uh, of government. Uh, clientelism, uh, I think, can simply be defined as the trading uh, of political support for a job or some kind of individual benefit. Uh, on the part of a, a, of a political supporter, uh, and it's the relationship between a powerful patron and uh, a weaker uh, client, and it is almost universal in, uh, in many societies. Uh, and I think that uh, the problem with clientelism uh, is uh, really in the public sector. You cannot have a modern uh, public sector in a country that appoints people on the basis of political connections. Uh, a modern public sector has to have the characteristics that the sociologist Max Weber associated with modern uh, bureaucracy. It has to be based on merit, on education, on functional, uh, functional di division of labor. And if you're giving out uh, jobs in the public sector to your party supporters, uh, you're not going to have an effective uh, government. And I think that Historically, uh, there is a real problem, uh, and, and one of the reasons that democracy in many cases has weakened uh, state administration is because uh, clientelism, I would argue, is an early form of democracy. Uh, it's sometimes simply associated with corruption, and people use these terms very uh, loosely, but I would say that clientelism in the form that I've defined it actually is uh, an early form of democracy. And the country that illustrates this, I think, the most clearly is the United States of America. The United States was the first country uh, in the world to uh, have universal white male suffrage. Uh, they opened up the vote uh, to all white males uh, in the 1820s in most American states. and. This really began with the election in 1828 of Andrew Jackson, really the first populist president of the United States. He came into office after being elected, uh, and he said two things. First, I won the election, and I should get to a point who runs the American government. And two, it doesn't take a genius. Th these were not his exact words, but in effect he said, it doesn't take a genius to be a civil servant in the United States. Anyone can do it. Uh, and therefore, my supporters can uh, have jobs in the federal government. And for the next 100 years, uh, the American government was run from the federal, state, and local levels by political appointees who owed their jobs to the fact that they supported a particular candidate uh, for office. Uh, for 100 years, uh, the American uh, bureaucracy 
was of extremely low quality uh, because of this mass uh, handing out of jobs. And one of the interesting historical questions is, you know, I, I believe that this is actually a natural way for democracies, uh, particularly uh, at relatively low levels of economic development and education. I think this is actually a natural way for them uh, to operate. And one of the interesting historical questions is why is it that you actually got modern Beberian uh, bureaucracies uh, appearing in certain uh, developed countries uh, and not in others? And here I think uh, there's a theory that I rely on which was developed by the political scientist Martin Schefter that says it's really about sequencing. That in certain countries, China, uh, Prussia, and then Germany, uh, Japan, uh, and France, and, and Britain as well, you could develop modern civil service uh, uh, administrations because these were developed in authoritarian periods of their history before those countries democratized. Best example of this is Prussia. Prussia uh, is a famous case where they developed a Reichstag, that is to say uh, a, a state administered through a bureaucracy that is based on uh, fairly clear and transparent law. This develops uh, in the late 17th, 18th, early 20th century, this consolidated in the Stein-Hardenberg uh, reforms after the Prussians are defeated by Napoleon uh, at the Battle of Jena in 1806. Germany, in a sense, develops the first really modern bureaucracy, and they do it because they are under intense military competitive pressure. Uh, the same thing happened in China about 2,000 years uh, prior to that. There is nothing like an existential threat to a country's existence to drive the formation of a modern Weberian bureaucracy. And Schefter's argument is that it was important that this happened before the country democratized, because once you establish this kind of modern autonomous bureaucracy, there's a constituency that wants to protect it, and that bureaucracy survives all of the subsequent uh, tumultuous events in German history. Unification in 1871, the First World War, the rise of Adolf Hitler, and finally defeat in 1945, and that bureaucracy runs the country after Germany democratizes in 1949, uh, had its roots in the Prussian bureaucracy that was created by uh, the great elector in the late 17th century. Uh, and that's not a happy story from the standpoint of, of democracy. Uh, it's basically saying the reason that Germany's got such an efficient bureaucracy today uh, is because it wasn't democratic and no German politician was able to load up the bureaucracy with their own political supporters. The contrary example to that is Greece. Uh, people may not be aware of this, but Greece was actually one of the first countries in Europe to adopt universal male franchise. This happened in the <coughs> 1860s, and it happened before the Greek state uh, was modernized. And in fact, the Greek state was always regarded by Greeks as illegitimate because as you know, Greece was a province of the Ottoman Empire uh, up until liberation in, in the late 1820s. It was dominated by foreigners, uh, and it was always seen as an object of political competition. Uh, and unfortunately, that system of patronage and clientelism has not <coughs> gone away to this moment. The reason that Greece got in trouble in the Euro crisis was that after the return of democracy to Greece in 1974, <coughs> the two main Greek political parties, New Democracy and, and um, the Pan, uh, um, PESOC, the, the Pan-Hellenic uh, League, traded places, and every time they traded places, they would stuff the bureaucracy with their own political supporters, which is why Greece has seven times as many civil servants per capita as Great Britain does. And that's part of the reason they could not rec control their wage bill, and that is part of the reason why they initiated the Euro crisis that struck the entire European Union in, um, uh, in 2010. Uh, and so this is a real tension, I think, because democratic societies are inclined to interpret 
democratic control over government in these patronage clientelistic terms that the government is uh, an object of competition and a place to put their political supporters, and that is simply incompatible uh, with modern government. Now, if you read my book, you'll see that you can get out of this situation. The United States actually did get out of this situation in the progressive era. It succeeded in creating a modern uh, Baberian uh, bureaucracy uh, from the 1883 uh, up until the Roosevelt administration in the 1930s, so it's not a, 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 an impossible situation. But again, to relate this to the situation in Georgia, the one thing that worries me, so the reason we came to Georgia uh, uh, working with, with Nino uh, and her center was that Georgia is, of course, famous for this public sector reform that was done under the previous uh, government. And it's a very impressive, uh, it's a very impressive reform. In turn, we, we were just at the public service center uh, with the justice minister looking at the one-stop shopping uh, uh, uh you know, the kiosks and all of that. And, and I think the performance in, in, in the increase in the quality of, of the state uh, was, was very impressive. Uh, and the low levels of corruption that were achieved uh, in that period were quite remarkable. However, the one thing that did not happen was actually the creation of an impersonal, protected public service. And I think that the big danger that really faces this country now is that with, you know, hopefully future, present and future changes of administration between parties, that those parties, uh, you know, will continue to see the public service as uh, a place uh, to put their supporters. And if that happens, uh, and if you do not create a protected space for an impersonal public service, then I think the quality of the reforms that have been achieved up to this point are going to be very uh, vulnerable. Second issue has to do with citizen security. This is an obvious point of conflict between strong, you know, strong state and, and uh, democracy because basically policemen oftentimes, you know, they're, they're given a monopoly of violence uh, by the state and they can abuse it. Uh, they can abuse it uh, very easily. And controlling uh, police behavior is one of the central tasks of any modern uh, democracy. Uh, now here I'm going to try to give you a little bit more of a uh, positive or a hopeful message. Uh, and again, I know that this was one of the problems uh, you know, with the past administration and one of the reasons that uh, you know, the present government came to power was because of abuses in the police system. Uh, so Nobody has to, you know, you don't have to explain why this, is, why this is a problem. I would say, however, that if you look at police practices, there is a considerable overlap between democracy and good policing uh, that is wrapped up in the concept of community policing. Uh, that is to say, some of the most uh, impressive initiatives in new models of policing involve actually democratic, direct democratic control uh, over the police. This is most uh, evident in Latin America. I spent a lot of time in Latin America. And um, let me just give you one little anecdote that, that will illustrate this. The most violent country right now in the Western Hemisphere is Honduras. It has the highest murder rate uh, of any country in the Western Hemisphere. The safest country in the Western Hemisphere is the one that's right next door to it, which is Nicaragua. Now, Nicaragua is run by a corrupt, you know, <laughs> not very nice uh, uh, semi-authoritarian government, but it has adopted a community policing model in which you cannot be a policeman in your neighborhood if the community does not vote for you and approve you as a policeman. The head of the police, the national police, is a woman, uh, the police are highly embedded in their local communities, uh, and uh, this, I think, uh, is one of the reasons why it has such uh, a low murder rate, because the police are trusted. That's the basic issue. If a community does not trust the police, they will not give them information, the police cannot get uh, intelligence, and therefore, democratic control over the police is critical to the police being able to do their job. 
Uh, on the other hand, if the police abuse citizens uh, uh, and, and behave arbitrarily, citizens aren't going to cooperate. Uh, and this has happened in Medellin, Colombia. It's happened now. It's, it's going on in Brazil. A lot of these countries have huge problems with narco trafficking, gang violence, uh, and the like. And the democratic control of state institutions is critical to solve the problem. Third area has to do with national identity. Uh, I think that strong state administration has to be based on a concept of nation that transcends family, clan, tribe, ethnicity, uh, and the like. Uh, and therefore, you can't really have good public administration without worrying about things like national identity. But again, this is a real problem from the standpoint of democracy because, first of all, creating national identity usually, you know, just like strong state uh, uh, Weberian bureaucracy, historically, this has often been done by authoritarian governments that can declare a national language, a national religion, uh, you know, some other exclusive form uh, of identity. Uh, and that is obviously a problem from the standpoint of tolerance and uh, rule of law. Uh, here again, I would say that democracy can be a solution to this because democracy itself can be a source of identity. If, de if identity is based on religion, ethnicity, or race, or any other ascriptive characteristic that people have no control over, then you're going to get intolerance uh, and discrimination uh, in the exercise of that identity. Uh, but there are other examples, and I, here I would point to my own country, the United States, uh, where identity is based on political criteria that are basically race and ethnicity and religion neutral. Americans' identity is based in democracy itself. It's based in respect for the American Constitution and for American democratic principles. And that is what has made the United States so open to immigration, to foreigners, and such a terrific uh, engine of assimilation. Uh, so in all of these areas, I think, you know, I, I won't go into the Georgian case here, but, you know, there, there are clearly uh, issues having to do with uh, 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 tolerance uh, that, that you face, uh, but there are uh, ways of resolving these issues. So with that, I'm sorry I spoke uh, for too long, but thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to the other comments. Many thanks. So, um, very interesting um, insights. And as we saw, there are actually and there can be plenty of contradictions um, uh, between um, state building and democracy. And I, I hope we can come back to um, each of those points during our discussion. Uh, so, with this, I, I would like to um, give floor to um, Mr. Jensen and um, uh, Sweet. So, Thank you very much. Uh, I too am delighted to uh, be here. Frank and I love to uh, hang out with professors and students, so, uh, and dignitaries too if they come along. Uh, <laughs> so it's, uh, it, it's wonderful to, uh, uh, to be here at Free University. Uh, I'm going to continue the narrative on contradictions, uh, I'm afraid. So it's going to, to get a little serious for a while, but I'm going to end on a positive note, I, I promise you, especially uh, being here in Georgia, uh, there's a, a, a positive note that I can end on. And many countries in which I work, I don't have, I cannot construct a positive story. Uh, so uh, congratulations, <laughs> Georgia. Um, so uh, politicians from uh, developed uh, countries travel to many developing countries and uh, uh, say uh, X country needs the rule of law. Uh, and I thought since uh, I, I'm, I'm with Professor Fukuyama here and he's really one of the world's foremost authorities on, on d democracy and stateness, I thought I'd take, and, and since I am a, a lawyer and law professor, I thought I'd talk a, a bit about rule of law and stateness. Um, and here again, uh, Weber is, uh, is helpful uh, in helping us to understand uh, and contextualize 
uh, the role of uh, law and society, and his insights, I think, are quite important. Uh, he observed that custom and convention control our behavior to an extraordinary extent. And if we're going to pass a law that is contrary to custom, you know, habits that we have, or convention, our functioning, uh, fearing uh, disapproval and seeking approval, that laws will probably not be effective. And I think empirically around the world we can, we can see that problem uh, when uh, laws are passed that go contrary to custom and convention. Am I too close to the microphone? Um, Max Weber also talked about uh, legal coercion. What is legal coercion? It's the coercive action of the uh, state based on law. Hans Kelsen, a, a phenomenal uh, founder of uh, constitutional courts in Austria and really the constitutional court model, uh, defined rule of law very simply as a normative system backed by the credible threat of force. Legal coercion is uh, difficult if you're going against custom and convention. And one of the basic insights here that, that I've derived from Weber is that legal coercion is a scarce commodity and it's expensive. So if you're going to, um, uh, if you have to exert a lot of pressure and a lot of expense on the enforcement of a, uh, a, a certain law, you better uh, choose very carefully because if you're going to try to enforce all of your laws through a very rigorous enforcement uh, machinery, uh, the likelihood is that uh, you're not going to be able to do that. And this is one of the basic problems that um, state building engineers have when they go into countries and, and, and say, we want to create all of these state institutions and we want to create all of these laws, but that's a really expensive proposition and what happens when donor funding recedes. Um, there's a, another aspect to state building and, and rule of law in earlier stages uh, and even in later stages, and that is something called legal pluralism. We've got over overlapping jurisdictions in, in countries. It's not just the formal laws, the secular laws that we have on the books. Uh, it, it can be religious law. Uh, it can be uh, 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 commercial law. It can be customary law. And there are different uh, 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 spheres of influence in this system of what I call legal pluralism. There are also legal substitutes uh, that I think will be very familiar to you, uh, and they also need to be understood in the state building process. Uh, relationships, clans, patrimonialism, as, as Professor Fukuyama was talking about. Uh, good faith dealing among merchants. I, I understand that uh, a Free University has a rich uh, tradition of, uh, of uh, economics, and so I'm going to in, indulge those of you who are interested uh, uh, in the next few minutes. Uh, guilds, associations, private security firms are also uh, substitutes, uh, legal substitutes, as, as I call them. Um, one thing that we uh, see across uh, uh, systems is a, is a correlation uh, uh, between, this, this is, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm hurting your ears here, um, a strong correlation between uh, uh, a strong rule of law and strong democracy. Uh, I, I, what, what you might call a, a thin rule of law has at a minimum some constraint and some limitation on, on uh, 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 government and some specification of, of individual rights. Uh, Weber's uh, insights uh, imply a modesty about the role of courts in early state building efforts. Courts become, a, and there's a danger that courts become a proxy battleground uh, for disputes about broader social, political, and economic issues. And there is also an enforcement uh, issue, too. It's, it's expensive, as I, I, I said. Now, the rest of my remarks are going to relate to the rule of law and economic growth and development. There is an assertion that a well-functioning judiciary is necessary for economic growth and development. Um, the, the, the problem is, as we look at the post-World War II era, there's really not empirical evidence for this assertion. Indeed, uh, Adam Smith observed that in early stages of development, there's what he called uh, previous accumulation. The accumulation of stock must, in the nature of things, be previous to the division of labor. Uh, Karl Marx called it primitive accumulation. Uh, the separation of people from their means of production, that is, expropriation or enslavement. In, in, in I'm afraid that uh, 
uh, primitive accumulation at early stages of development is not the exception, it is the rule. Uh, even Stanford University is built on the, uh, was built by a robber baron who uh, exploited labor and building railroads and the like. Uh, you know, he, uh, he felt guilty later in his life and he spent a lot on, on philanthropy. Likewise Ford, likewise Carnegie. Uh, 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 these were the robber barons of the era and guilty of what Mar Karl Marx would call primitive accumulation. The vast majority uh, weight of evidence at early stages of development is that a well-functioning judiciary is not necessary for economic growth and development, and that law is not necessarily more effective, cost-effective than legal substitutes. And the three most dramatic examples in the post-World War II era are China, long-run growth for uh, 35, 36 years, uh, uh, India, uh, again a story of long-run growth since the, the uh, early 90s. China, uh, during this period, when it started its long-run growth, most of its uh, judges were uh, retired members of the, uh, 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 the army. They had no legal training whatsoever. Now, uh, today in China, it's, it, it, there are many more well-trained legal professionals, but certainly during most of this period of um, uh, 30 years, uh, China did not have well-trained professionals, and certainly China is not known for strong rule of law. Um, uh, India is another e example. Uh, uh, an Indian banker once famously said, uh, if we have a strong case, we settle. If we have a weak case, we go to court. Uh, and that's uh, really the story in, in, in India. Its legal institutions can ensure uh, the status quo but have a very difficult time ensuring anything else. And then we have the East Asian miracles, S Singapore, uh, uh, Hong Kong, Korea. Uh, uh, legal institutions weren't a part of that dramatic growth story uh, at all. Uh, so the best working hypothesis is really Albert Hirschman's uh, hypothesis that he stated years ago that there are on-again, off-again connections between um, uh, between law and economic growth and development. Um, risk and economic growth. There are all sorts of different kinds of uh, risk. It's not just legal risk. There's commercial risk, fluctuating markets, political risk, uh, regulatory risk and uh, administrative actions, uh, security risk, and what I call social risk. What is social risk? Uh, when civil society institutions rise up against certain types of investments, uh, or insist on, as they did in South Africa, that uh, HIV AIDS retrovirals uh, be offered at affordable prices, uh, to, uh, on the business side, that's viewed as a social risk. That's not something the pharmaceutical companies were, were including in their, their, their risk model. So how much legal security is, is needed varies from uh, uh, country to country and from types, uh, one type of in industry to another. I'll give you an extreme example of, of uh, security and an investment that, that might surprise you. Um, uh, the cell phone network in uh, towers in Afghanistan are extraordinary. I have better cell phone service in Afghanistan than I do in uh, Palo Alto, California. Uh, and uh, uh, the reason for that is that the U.S. Uh, uh, Defense Department installed uh, uh, very credible uh, uh, cell phone towers ar across Afghanistan because they needed to communicate, and commercial interests piggybacked on those cell phone towers. Now, why aren't these cell phone towers bombed uh, day in and day out? We know the problems with, with basic security in Afghanistan. Well, the, the issue is that everyone needs their cell phones. Uh, in, including those who are engaged in terrorist activity. So these cell phone towers are, are uh, some of the most secure investment in, uh, in Afghanistan. Um, uh, when we, uh, one thing that is very clear from watching uh, countries develop in the post-World War II era is that demand for law and legal institutions grows as economies grow. And uh, that's, uh, I'm, I'm getting to the point of, of Georgia here and why, uh, why Georgia should start to feel pretty good. We know that uh, the OECD countries um, all have, the, the be most developed countries of the world, have a uh, relatively strong rule of law. I might take exception to Italy, but, but uh, let's, not, let's not parse here. But it doesn't tell the causal story. So we know that, that an end game is, is strong rule of law, uh, uh, strong democracies and, and strong economies. Um, but where is the tipping point? And uh, I, I hope to uh, in, engage in this research with uh, some of my colleagues at the law school over the uh, next year 
uh, looking at, at tipping points uh, because it, it strikes all of us that early stages of development are characterized by the rule of non-law rather than the rule of law. Uh, but the, the, the tipping point as I look at uh, uh, Korea, Singapore, Costa Rica, Chile, um, uh, other countries where there seemed to be a consolidation in uh, rule of law and, and a demand for a, a, a sort of a national program of law reform and, and strengthening of rule of law is at around 8,000 uh, GDP per capita. And indeed, that's uh, also a tipping point on uh, another piece of good news for, for, uh, for Georgia is that it's also a tipping point on sustainability of democracies. Rarely when, when uh, uh, countries achieve uh, Georgia's level, uh, uh, le level of growth and a little bit more, do they recede into uh, authoritarian uh, ways. So uh, that's my uh, good story, uh, my positive story for, for, for Georgia is you've got healthy growth, uh, you're at the tipping point where you usually find a consolidation of rule of law. I expect very interesting uh, movement on the rule of law front over the next few years in, in, in Georgia. And it's also uh, a point at which you rarely find uh, slipping back into uh, authoritarian ways. So congratulations, Georgia. Many thanks um, for this. Um interesting intervention. So we learned that there is contradiction between state building and democracy and let's the basic uh, takeaway uh, from the latest intervention is that there is also contradiction sometimes between economic development and the rule of law. So let's try to come back to, to these issues um, later on. So with this, uh, I would like to invite Mr. Gia Nodia. Uh, please, Gia, the floor Thank is you. yours. Thank you. I will also start with uh, contradictions theoretically, uh, in a theoretical level, and then we'll uh, go on to some observations about Georgia. Uh, uh, so I would summarize uh, in a little bit dramatic way what was said already uh, by, two, by two distinguished professors, but in a Marxist, la Marxist uh, language, which is really Hegelian maybe, that democracy is dialectical unity of the opposites. Uh, if, or fight of the op opposite things. And those two opposites is on the one hand it's uh, state or state understood as an executive first of all, uh, strong executive, effective executive which could, can enforce uh, of course legitimate use of force which means it can uh, um, um, enforce rules and implement policy um, policies. So. Uh, for that, you need concentration of power and creating effective hierarchy of power. And uh, that is really contrary to what Democrats like, because uh, democracy is about uh, equality rather than hierarchy. Democrats don't like hierarchy. And it's about diffusion of power rather than concentration of power. So somehow, uh, intuitively or emotionally, maybe Democrats don't like uh, uh, effective uh, executive. But as we know from Hobbes, uh, if we don't have it, we are in real trouble. There is no order, there is no security. Nobody can enforce any agreements if we reach them. There is no economic development. And as he, Hobbes, sum summarizes it, the life of each of us is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So what can we do? Uh, what we, uh, uh, in order to have democracy, we need to balance it with something, so that strong executive should be checked and balanced with something else. As we all know, it's, uh, I think anybody who speaks about democracy knows that. But it's not uh, uh, sufficient to write these uh, checks and balances in the Constitution. It's not uh, insufficient to write that there should be independent judiciary, and in order to do that, judges should be appointed so and so, and or there should be independent parliament, and there should be local government, and then we'll have balance. Uh, it would be nice if it were so, and constitutional lawyers would be even better people than, and more appreciated people than they already are, but unfortunately this is not the case. There needs to be some kind of, uh, uh, these balancing actors should be strong institutions and strong social forces. And historically, uh, those institutions and forces may be very different. Francis Fukuyama yesterday spoke about the role of Catholic Church 
and in the West, this uh, competition between power of the Pope and power of uh, secular princes was very important for development of rule of law and democracy. Um, but it may be other things. It may be aristocracy versus, uh, versus monarch. Uh, in uh, more modern, uh, more recent uh, context, it may be somehow more ideologically driven also like uh, supporters of states and supporters of the Union in the United States when it was created, or supporters of pro-labor uh, left and pro-business right, or whatever. It uh, differs from country to country. And it, if it, it's even better if you don't have just two poles, but several. I think in a uh, uh, brilliant book of Francis Fukuyama, on political order, he writes in a very enlightening way about this kind of triangle. You have monarchy, you have aristocracy, but you have also cities with their commercial and uh, the, you know, later also manufacturing interests. And then you have more space of maneuver, you have to need some allies against somebody, and then this, uh, has, uh, this is, uh, m you know, uh, this com more complex, complex structure in that sense is better, or also it was good when there was Catholic Church versus secular princes, but when there came also Reformation and Protestant churches and different Protestant churches, then political game became even more complex and even greater kind of spaces for, for the liberty. So in that sense, pluralism is uh, very good and necessary, but there is great but uh, that uh, uh, this fight between the opposites may lead to democracy, but it may lead to civil war. It's uh, even more often, sometimes. Because uh, fights, if you have two, two or more, but in the classical and simplest uh, uh, case, two forces that fight each other, they obviously want to destroy each other. That's the first instinct. It's kind of human nature. So if we look at uh, in, in, uh, England, which is the first... Uh, kind of case, European case of uh, modern democracy. We have Magna Carta, which is basically a truce in a uh, very vicious fight between very nasty King John and barons or aristocracy who were also nasty guys. And they had this truce. And Mag Magna Carta is a great uh, document of democracy. When we started CIPDD, the first book we published were classical documents of democracy in Georgia, and Magna Carta was a uh, was, uh, was the first one in, in that book. Yeah. So, and, uh, but basically that Magna Carta, or great, great Charter, as it's called, was violated all the time from both sides, especially kings, of course, were, were not happy about it. And uh, so it, that fight continued for years, and it climaxed in the 17th century when there was first uh, civil war, where King Charles was beheaded, and then there was a glorious revolution. And this revolution is glorious because it, uh, after it, England found a formula where there was king, not beheaded, never, uh, British king was never beheaded ever since, but there were also constitutional uh, limitations of power, and all kings recognized that there should be constitutional limitations of power. Of course, spe specific uh, way of those limitations change over time, but this basic formula was found. But they needed, how many? Five centuries it was to re reach that formula. And uh, um, in other countries, uh, other countries had to fight their own wars, civil wars, revolutions, whatever, until they uh, fought their own formulas. You cannot just transplant British formula, for instance, to Georgia or Armenia or whatever. So to sum up uh, this uh, dramatic picture a little bit, uh, one could say that I would say that democracy needs preconditions, but uh, those precond I don't mean those kinds of preconditions as we usually speak in democratic theory, social economic preconditions of which uh, Seymour Martin Lipset spoke, like industrialization, urbanization, in, uh, educated middle class, etc., but uh, political preconditions. So first there should be effective and centralized state with uh, critical level of state capacity. On the other hand, there should be genuine pluralism of social forces and institutions that try to balance the state. And finally, this contestation should lead to some kind of working formula where they can work together uh, and coexist and share power, other than continuous uh, civil wars, upheavals, coups, revolutions, etc. 
So in other words, democracy is basically the most important thing about democracy. It's about managing pluralism. If you try to suppress pluralism, it's also management of pluralism, you suppress it. You have tyranny. If you allow it an unlimited way, it's chaos. But if you uh, create rules that everybody accepts, although nobody is usually fully happy about those rules, then it's called democracy. And uh, in this situation, uh, we have a quite, uh, in practical sense, a quite a complex uh, and challenging set of uh, choices uh, and uh, preferences, rather. Uh, democracy is better than autocracy. I don't think there is, a, I hope maybe that anybody in this, rule, in this room will contest that, even if somebody thinks so, probably would not dare to say <laughs> so. <in the laughs>. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, is this the choice? Maybe the choice is between autocracy and disorder, like Hobbesian yeah. choice. Or maybe the choice it is about old uh, kind of autocracy or a new autocracy, uh, which is uh, new, new tyranny, which uh, creates new tyranny on the basis of criticizing previous autocracy. And it's in the name of the people, we call tyranny of majority or some kind of populist uh, tyranny. What choice is there? What, what is the choice we have? And this is, I think, big problem on the level of democratization. It's one thing to discuss uh, accomplished uh, democracies. It's another thing to discuss ways to democracies, which we call democratization. Of course, starting point is, is always autocracy. I mean, um, what Hobbes and Locke said, that first it is state of the nature. It's more kind of abstract concept. Usually, it, we don't start democracy from state of the nature. We confront, we have autocracy, we confront it, and then uh, something happens. But what happens when we confront autocracy and try to undermine and destroy autocracy and fight autocracy. Uh, of course, we may lose. I don't consider that, uh, that option. But if, we, we, if uh, uh, contesters of autocracy win, uh, then there are different outcomes. One is uh, democracy, like it was in Hungary after the uh, collapse of the Soviet system, or in Latvia, or in some other happy places. Or they may be disorder and the civil war, as now we have in Syria, which is they confronted Bashar Assad, who is a terrible dictator. What they got is a democracy? No, it's civil war, which nobody knows when it will end. Our case in 1990s was milder, not that dramatic, but similar. We got basically civil war and chaos. This is second option. Or you may have kind of new, new tyranny, new autocracy, but kind of people's tyranny, like, and it, it is, I would argue, the story of French, Russian, Iranian, and recently Egyptian revolutions, uh, whatever differences between them. And the problem is we don't know beforehand what will happen. When we start fighting autocracy, of course, we always uh, hope that democracy will be the outcome, but we don't know. So um, it means that uh, we, should, we take risks, and it's uncertainty, yes. Philip Schmitter is a famous uh, scholar of democratic transitions. He says that the most important concept of democratic transitions is uncertainty. We just don't know. But we, if we are lucky, we get democracy. But the risk is worth it, uh, because if we are uh, successful, uh, then outcome is uh, very good, and benefits are really great, because as it is not just uh, because democracy has lofty ideas, uh, of human rights, etc., but because it's historically proven that democracy is the best political regime, it provides the best uh, package, let's say so, of security, uh, stability, uh, economic development, economic welfare, individual freedom, um, and whatnot. So the reward is great. Uh, uh, but uh, now about Georgia. That's, uh, that, was, that was part of the theory. Now where we are. Now we have one, we are good at taking risks. We are not afraid of taking <laughs> risks, right? We keep trying and, and keep, or keep confronting governments which we call autocratic, and to some extent they are autocratic, yeah. So, but we also keep failing. Uh, uh, what in uh, this jargon of uh, the, the democratization theory, we have lots of democratic openings, but no consolidations. That's our problem. 
So this makes us unhappy Democrats, or in Hegelian terms, uh, carriers of unhappy democratic consciousness, unhappy minds. And foreigners sometimes don't understand our unhappiness and even congratulate us on our successes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the problem is de it depends what is your uh, reference. I mean, uh, regionally we are actually doing well. If we are judged by regional standards and it's very unpopular to quote uh, George W. Bush on anything, but he was right when he said that we are a big beacon of democracy then and we are still beacon of democracy regionally. But we are ambitious people, we don't, it's not enough for us, we want to be like, like Europe. I mean, I remember one uh, Georgian Democrat, he said that when Soviet Union was, uh, uh, you know, in trouble and Georgia was becoming independent, I was sure that in five years would be like Portugal more or less, no less. I mean, maybe not exactly England, but somehow Portugal was considered more realistic target. But we are that. So why? The question is a very big question is why? And I cannot say I have an answer. I have to disappoint you if you expected that. It's not the case. Uh, but I will share some observations. And, uh, but uh, in Georgia, generally, you have two schools of thought. Uh, of course, Georgia keep trying to answer that question, why we cannot make it, really. And there are two schools of thought. One is we are unhappy with our, un unlucky, sorry with our leaders. We always uh, 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 elect wonderful people. We think they are wonderful and they will bring us democracy. And then it turns out that they like power too much and they don't deliver democracy. So we keep frustrated and every now and then we do revolutions again or something like revolutions and then again keep, uh, keep uh, frustrated and that's kind of cycle. Another school of thought, uh, more popular among kind of enlightened public, is that our people is wrong. <laughs> it's people is bad people. We, people just, uh, it's not democratic people, let's say so, if one could say so. Now, uh, which one of those are tr is true? Okay, there is some uh, kernel of truth in both of those ideas, I think, but I don't think they are, uh, sufficient to understand our problems. So I, I, as a professor, I would prefer to say that we don't, underst we don't understand what democracy is really, so I will explain you and then maybe we'll have it, which is more a little bit platonic idea, but of course I'm joking, but anyway. So I will uh, 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 share several points and that will be all. One is uh, about underestimation of state. That Georgians, uh, many of, not all of them, but many of Georgians don't really understand the importance of state for democracy. I mean, some people, Georgians, uh, of course, like state, but they think that having strong state is somehow contrary to democracy. I think Frank sp spoke, and both of you spoke about that. I mean, uh, Huntington, Samuel Huntington said in uh, his book, which I also mentioned a couple of days ago, Political Order in Changing Society, and Frank also mentioned in his book that in the West, people underestimate state, Western Democrats, because they take state for granted. So they only speak about balancing state and how to limit state, but they think that because they lived in states all the time, so they think that states are somehow part of nature, but it's, it's not so. Um, now, in Georgia, I think we have different problem because we lived in communism and we think state is about suppression, oppression, repression, and some press pressure, <laughs> pressing, <laughs> something very bad. Therefore, if you are a Democrat, you have to be against state. If you are for state, you are for autocracy. I know it's not only in Georgia. I mean, Samuel Huntington also got lots of criticism, especially from the left, that he justified authoritarianism. So sometimes I I'm don't compete with Huntington, but I have same criticism in Georgia quite often, that because I say that it's good to have strong state or you like auto autocracy. And you, but uh, uh, the problem is that despite all those contradictions that are there, and despite the fact that while building an effective state, uh, there may be some, uh, you know, behaviors of the government which are uh, not perfect from uh, 
from the viewpoint of accomplished democracy, still it is absolutely necessary precondition for democracy to have strong state. So if you have an effective state, you have much better starting point at least to having democracy. That of course comes, brings into question the very politically controversial, more politically than scientifically controversial uh, concept of sequencing on which basically actually Frank also said that sometimes it's, uh, historically at least it's okay to say that about history that when countries develop strong states and then developed uh, democracies, it somehow worked in some cases. Second problem that we have is that we believe in what I, I uh, call hegemonic democratization or top-down democratization, which uh, somehow I already mentioned uh, that we believe that if we get some benevolent democratic king, that he will build democracy on, from top-down. So democracy is about hegemony of Democrats. I think uh, current government believes in this and previous government believed in that, that if we are good Democrats at the top, that is democracy. Um, so if there is no democracy, then it's fault of government. So government behaves badly. And if there is democracy, it's because government behaves well. So that's more or less an assumption, which, is, which I think is fundamentally wrong. Uh, it is important to have good people in government, including people who believe in democracy. I certainly don't contest that, but I also believe that any government will be autocratic if it's allowed to. And American founders or framers uh, and, uh, wrote so wonderful constitution also because they based it on this principle that there is no, uh, you cannot have democracy hell hoping for wonderful Democrats at the top. All Democrats be may become autocrats if you are not careful. So accountability and limitations of power should be imposed from the outside on the state and from outside institutions. Now not, it cannot be within uh, executive uh, because they are good people. And, uh, but of course the revolutions, we love like revolutions. Revolutions are sometimes unavoidable, uh, but they, rarely lead to democracy. There are some nice exceptions like American Revolution, but it's not typical, unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know. So we, we had this, uh, uh, so you, you have to impose uh, uh, accountability on state without destroying state. That's very important, which people in Georgia don't always understand. We had this wonderful slogan uh, in September 2012 uh, destroy the system, right? Like it was in English. Uh, yeah, I think it was stupid slogan, frankly, because you should not destroy the system. You should improve the system and balance the system, not destroy it. If you destroy the system, you're always in this vicious, sense, vis vicious circle. System is destroyed, then it's rebuilt again, and uh, there is no end to it. Uh, and by the way, I would say that at attitudes of international democratic community sometimes encourages that uh, concept of hegemonic democratization, especially this concept which is also promoted by Stephen Levitsky and Lucan Wei, who are very smart uh, analysts, of course, but about democratization through Europeanization, that democracy can be imposed by Europe through some kinds of leakage, linkage and leverage, so that countries don't want to be democratic, but uh, Europe will make you democratic, and it's very popular in Georgia also. If you say that we, democracy is not so good, but Europe asks us and American ambassador asks us to be democratic, so we should, uh, you know, somehow behave well because we are watched by ambassadors uh, and ambassadors will be get angry at us, so, but <laughs> <laughs> so that's why we have to be democratic. I believe very much in European integration and Euro-Atlantic integration, but uh, I'm afraid that uh, neither American ambassadors nor European ambassadors will make us democratic or NATO and European Union. It will help, but it will not make the cr crucial difference. Uh, thirdly, uh, uh, li people will never limit, be able to limit government. People will never be able to enforce accountability on the government. Uh, day before yesterday, we heard our president who said, when I uh, said that, you know, what is the hope that, you know, 
if you think the previous government was autocratic, why don't, will not you become autocratic? He said, oh, people will not allow us. Unfortunately, that sounds wonderful, but it's not true. People is very abstract and confusing term. Sometimes people like autocrats, and sometimes people actually justify tyranny of the majority or tyranny in the name of the majority. And Mr. Putin has 84% uh, uh, you know, approval rating, I heard. So just people is not enough. It's, it's we know historically that it's uh, um, um, institutions and the social uh, and organized social forces that can limit government. They are extremely crucial for that. Um, and that is the key, key variable, as one would say, which I think we are lacking. We, we're lacking those strong institutions and um, <clears throat> social forces, organized social forces that can, can, can do it. Uh, and uh, one can say that we have a church, church that maybe hates liberal democracy and the West, but theoretically it can be considered some kind of balancing force to government. Or sometimes we have billionaires as balancing force to the government. We had Patar Katsishvili who balanced, tried to balance the government. We had Ivanishvili who tried to somehow confront the government successfully, as we would say, the latter one. But when this billionaire is behind the government, then it uh, becomes more dangerous, uh, difficult. So, um, and we don't have real political parties. Our NGOs are wonderful and do a wonderful job, and I hope mine too, but it's not social force that can confront the government. So uh, that's kind of structural problem that we have. But last point is that when we have that pluralism, we don't appreciate it. We think it's terrible, that pluralism is totally unacceptable. Um, uh, or rather we accept pluralism as abstract term, but not real pluralism. And I also mentioned before, sorry for repeating, all governments say that opposition is wonderful and we need opposition, but this particular opposition which is now here, it should be destroyed, it cannot exist, it's either traitors or criminals or it should be in jail or put out, get out of country or something. But opposition is needed, of course, generally, yes. <laughs> So, and this is, uh, this is, uh, this causes this uh, special confrontational political culture. I think Frank yesterday meant that to the audience, said to the audience that your problem is those two political parties that hate each other so much. I would say that yes, but not really because it's not just political parties. Political parties may pretend to hate each other and not hate each other so much really, but it's also they are expected and push to hate each other because it's very, uh, not very well understood to that um, uh, pluralism is something good. Uh, so uh, the last uh, kind of very short summary, so we need two things basically to have democracy in Georgia. Now I get, I, I've got a recipe. First we have to build institutional and uh, societal pluralism and expression of that institutional societal pluralism. And second, we will maybe need some more great experience of destroying and fighting each other because we, we understand that we need some rules to coexist. Thanks a lot. Um, many thanks to all the, uh, all the three panelists. Uh, too many interesting uh, <laughs> and insightful ideas here. Uh, frankly speaking, I have two basic uh, takeaways from all this. Um, um, speeches. We're dying uh, to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> well, one is when it comes to development, you can't have everything. Like you cannot have rule of law and economic development and state building and democracy at the same time. And second, you have to take the risk without knowing wh what you get at the end, even if you plan and hope for the best. Uh, so um, with this, I want to uh, move to the question and answer session. I would ask all of you uh, first to identify yourselves and then maybe say to whom the question goes to and we will gather three or four questions at a time and then ask our panelists to provide answers. Um, so there are three, let's start with this uh, <laughs> part of the audience. So there are three questions over there. There is one from Nino. One from Gia and um, uh, um, 
Thank you very much. My name is Nino Lapiashvili. I'm the director of the Institute for European Studies at Tbilisi State University. It's a really great honor to see Professor Francis Fukuyama and Professor Eric Jensen in Georgia at the premises of Free University. I'm really uh, grateful and thankful to everybody who made this day possible. So my uh, question is about why contemporary leading democracies are doing so bad versus uh, contemporary leading autocracies. Maybe, um, maybe um, the, the answer is um, how we understand the liberty as such. Maybe we should understand the John Rawlsian uh, liberty, liberty as a complex of rights and duties as defined by the institutions, or maybe we should refer to uh, refer to to Bastia, uh, who says that the state is a great fiction where everybody is trying to live at the expense of others, and um, and life, liberty, and property are the, the, the um, are the uh, core uh, faculties that God. God, God gave to us and state is supposed to protect these uh, three faculties. Uh, so what is, what is the concept of liberty in, the in, in, in this discourse, in, this discourse uh, uh, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, correlation of rule of law uh, and uh, democracy? Thank you so much. Okay. Um, please, Andre, um, and then Gia has a question. Yeah. Andre Larian of Kate Institute. <clears throat> My question is uh, to all distinguished uh, 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 guests, uh, including actually a uh, moderator as well. Um, uh, Professor Nodia has mentioned that probably in this room everybody is in favor of democracy, not autocracy. Uh, please allow me to play the role of the devil's advocate. Uh, I would say that, okay, I'm for autocracy. And just uh, imagine for a second that it's, you see not me, but my former boss. Mr. Putin, or Mr. Lukashenko from Belarus, or Chinese leaders. And um, it's kind of, I state, or we state, that autocracy is better than democracy, this new autocracy. It has much a more effective state right now that produces much higher growth rate, that uh, has much more effective state institutions, that has a much more powerful military machine that we can, we can see, you can see everywhere. Uh, not everywhere, but in some places. So, uh, in all, and especially compared to some democratic, or definitely much more democratic states like Ukraine, or European states, or even the United States, that cannot produce adequate response to our behavior. Please try to convince me, why should I abandon my autocratic attitudes and move to your democracy? <laughs> Thank you, Andre. <laughs> I'm Gia Jandir from the Economic School, which is the free market um, think tank in Georgia. Not as old as Gia Nodias, but we are also quite old. So my, my question is some kind of continuation of my very good friends, Andre and Nino, questions. Uh, if democracy is so good, why Kyrgyzstan is so bad? I was in Kyrgyzstan last year. They have perfect democracy there. They are very proud of their two um, revolutions. If, if you ask them what, what to see in Bishkek, they will show you the place of the two revolutions. But my question is, is the democracy a goal? Is it a value? Thank you very much. So let's, um, I mean, we have three complex enough questions to answer, so let's first try to answer those. So uh, would you like to um, Yeah, so the questions are all related to one another. Well, first of all, I, <laughs> I don't accept the premise that democracy is doing so poorly uh, uh, compared to authoritarian governments. Um, both the United States and the European Union are in a bad period because they made policy mistakes. Uh, the United States, you know, allowed this big uh, subprime bubble to occur and then got into a big recession. Uh, the problem with the European Union really had to do with the design of the euro uh, itself, and so they're in a low growth period. Uh, and, uh, you know, this happens. Uh, so countries go through a decade of low growth and then uh, uh, but I think that democracy 
has got resources for fixing these problems that a lot of times authoritarian governments don't have. Now, the only authoritarian government uh, of all the ones that have been listed that I think has got any claim to being an alternative model is China. It is not Russia. I mean, Russia does not have a modern, uh, uh, efficient, effective state. It's, it's a rentier, you know, petro state based on corruption, can't provide basic services for its people. It's not even clear in the military sphere that they're all that good. I suspect if they actually came up against a serious military uh, opponent, they would fall apart uh, very quickly. Now, we can get into a discussion of China because I think China also has some long-term problems with sustainability, but uh, I would say that China is not a model that can be replicated anywhere outside of East Asia. Uh, and so therefore, it's, it's really not you know, that, that much of a, uh, that much of a uh, competitor. So I think any country can look bad in a, any given decade. The real test of a political system is how it sustains itself over multiple generations. And I just don't accept the premise that democracy is such a, such a bad system. On the last question, is democracy a goal? I'd say absolutely, because I believe that political agency, meaning the ability of people to participate in a political system and make common decision, contribute to common decisions uh, about their lives is an inherent part of, it's an inherent end of human, you know, what it means to be a, a flourishing human being. This is what Aristotle said. He said, man is a political animal by nature, meaning that you cannot achieve a fully lived human life if you somehow do not participate in politics. And therefore, I think that you know, democracy uh, expresses a kind of intrinsic good. Uh, I believe the rule of law, by recognizing that we have rights, recognizes our dignity as human beings, and, and those things have value in themselves. Go ahead, Jim. I want to thank Andrei Lariono for proving me wrong. I, um, corrected myself a little bit. I said that it's not that nobody believes that autocracy is better. Nobody would dare to say that. So it, b b um, I mean, because uh, we are somehow under pressure of political correctness and democracy is some kind of civil, civil religion which you are not allowed to, uh, c to uh, uh, criticize. Uh, but of course, we live in the world where democracy and autocracy as a model somehow are in competition and each of them have some advantages and disadvantages, one could say. But I would agree with uh, Frank that uh, on the balance, uh, democracies are doing better than autocracies. But I would also agree with Andre and Gia that autocracies often do better than semi-democracies or those kind of hybrid regimes in the short term. So uh, that is also true. So, uh, but uh, the problem is that it, while you're trying to become democracy, you may be in trouble. On the, on the road. <laughs> so, uh, Andre, I believe you've uh, exceeded the, the life expect uh, expectancy of a male Russian by maybe 10 or 15 years already. <laughs> uh, you know, maybe uh, I, uh, life isn't so, so great on, <laughs> on, on, on that side. Um, mm -hmm. But the, uh, I, I, I want to, I, I, I think uh, Professor Fukuyama's point about, you know, uh, this, this character in Hungary saying we're going to uh, to go a different uh, different path he's got pretty weak uh, a pretty weak empirical basis on which to do that if you look at you know which well-developed uh, sustainable uh, economy do we have in the world that is authoritarian there isn't one there's not one I, I well th you've got you've got uh, uh, total outliers like Qatar and you've got but I, I don't I'm not considering I, I, I'm actually going to, uh, I, I, I disagree with many of my colleagues at Stanford. Uh, I think that uh, Singapore in many ways has a democracy. They are weak on uh, the, the right to uh, 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 political association and, uh, 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 but, but they, they in many ways have the, the attributes of, uh, of democratic life. 
Uh, so I, I actually, I know that I'm, I'm uh, varying from my political science friends, but when I go to Singapore, my taxi drivers, uh, we, we drive by a, 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 a golf course, and he says, I'm a shareholder in that golf course. I mean, the, the, uh, uh, Singapore developed on wealth-sharing techniques that uh, one does not see, and, and this is sort of like also the argument of waiting for the great leader. Uh, Lee Kuan Yews don't come along uh, every day, and the whole autocratic model uh, assumes that the great leader is going to, uh, going to be there. And we all think, and I'm confident, that, that Singapore will evolve into a, a, a full democracy in, in, in the years to come. But there's also a risk of, of saying, okay, we're going to have autocracy now, we'll have democracy later. Uh, I think that's stupid, you know, uh, uh, when you think of uh, sequencing, what is going to guarantee the democracy uh, later? And as you develop economically, I think it's foolish not to think of political development as you develop economically. Uh, Eric, uh, excuse me, you're teasing me to continue this game. Sorry about that, but just as for male expectancy in Russia, just compare two periods. In the 90s, when Russia was much more democratic than today, the male life expectancy was falling and fell by roughly five years. In the last probably five, six years, under autocracy, male life expectancy is increasing. They just, it's, uh, once again, it adds to the, uh, the real serious issues. Of course in, it's and, now, in, and now in, in, now in the modern world. debate, it's a very serious issues to provide arguments that would be convincing, not only for Mr. Putin or Mr. Lukashenko, but for millions of people living in Russia, in Belarus, in Azerbaijan, in Kazakhstan, to explain why this autocratic, new autocratic system that have been created in those countries less attractive than democratic system in Kyrgyzstan, in Ukraine, in some kind of countries in European Union that, or United States that are spending last five years or so in economic crisis. Okay, um, uh, so let's... Um take the next round of questions. I will now move to the middle section of our <laughs> audience. So there was one question from Andro. There are um, two questions from the back. And um, let's, uh, I, I would ask uh, you to keep your questions very short as we are running out of time, please. Uh, <coughs> no, 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 no. Uh, my name is Giorgio Lominadze. I represent sorry, the... Sorry, there was first a question uh, okay. in the front. And Thank ahead. you. I represent the NGO Free Market. So, uh, first of all, I would uh, like to thank you all guests uh, for their uh, presentations. And uh, I have two questions to Dr. Fukuyama. Uh, first of all, um, on uh, September 18th, 2014, uh, Scotland, uh, Scottish uh, citizens will uh, vote on a referendum uh, whether Scotland should be independent or not from uh, United Kingdom. Uh, at the same time, uh, Catalonia, which is the part of Spain, uh, is not allowed to do the same thing uh, by the Spain, Spanish government. Uh, I have uh, such a question. What precedent uh, a Scottish referendum creates for a parts of countries uh, to secede from, from the country. I mean, uh, if uh, Scotland can secede, it doesn't matter right now whether Scottish citizens will vote yes or no. Uh, just, uh, I have such a question. If uh, Scottish people are allowed to do so, why uh, Texas, uh, Texan people aren't allowed to secede from the United States or Chechnya is not allowed to secede from uh, Russia, Russian Federation, or Eastern Ukraine, for that matter, is not allowed to secede from uh, Ukraine, and so on and so on. It's the first question. Uh, second question. Uh, I read your article in the New York Times, uh, which is called After uh, Neoconservatism. Uh, I have uh, such... Qu I know that you split from uh, neoconservatives uh, uh, with which you had uh, heard before. I have such a question. Uh, we are seeing what's happening in uh, uh, Iraq uh, um, and other parts of the uh, Middle East. And uh, what do you think? What is the, uh, whom we need to blame for that? 
neoconservatives or uh, uh, Mr. Obama? I mean Democrats. Uh, I guess that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please keep your questions short so that uh, everyone has enough time. Um, so Andrew wanted to ask a question. Um, he needs the mic. Is, um, Okay, please go ahead then with your question and pass the microphone down to the first one. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Mariam Tabatadze, representing Connecticut College here. Um, so I have a question about one of the comments that was made uh, repeatedly that we can't have it all, uh, meaning economic development and rule of law as well as state building and um, democracy can't exist together. Uh, I find this slightly unsettling because there's potentially many young policymakers here. Uh, would you advise a young policymaker to prioritize one over the other? And uh, is that even okay in a democratic, well, in a country that strives for democracy to kind of ignore a rule of law for economic development or, or things like that? Um, so I would really love to hear your thoughts. Thank you. works. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll try to be really brief. My, my name is Andrew Barnovi. Um, I have, have several hats, let's say, starting from political involvement and so on, uh, including academic a little bit. Uh, my question is, uh, if we are about to, um, let's say, uh, look for solutions, like real solutions, would you agree that uh, one of the key solutions to the democratic development is in education, because I was listening to you, you all three played around this notion, but nobody really mentioned it. Uh, and uh, uh, my question will particularly will go to Mr. Fukuyama, because you mentioned the Prussian system of education, not education, but the civil, civil service system. And you said uh, they developed this because they had a huge military pressure, which is right, of course, but then, uh, we have, uh, well, we, of course, we have heard about the state pietism system, which the Prussians have had, right? And it uh, was driven by uh, beliefs, largely. It was a branch of Protestant movement, and, well, I'm not going to explain this, because we all know this. And uh, to me, at least, uh, the main, uh, the, the key reason why the Prussians did develop that system was this belief system, which was later translated into political system as well, but it was done through the education, right? Okay, you mentioned Chinese system. Okay, it, it didn't develop into democracy, but at least as a, uh, there's very interesting examples there. I remember an article which I found a few years ago in JSTOR. Unfortunately, I don't remember the author now, but it, it was about how the Jewish community lost their identity only because, and when they decided to enroll their children into state service. And of course they had to go through this Confucian, Confucian state education system, which was very strong in China, and I'm talking now about the 6th, 7th century China, and this was the reason why, um, let's say a de decade ago, uh, after, later, uh, the synagogues became, be began to destroy, uh, and so, I mean, they just were abandoned because they lost it, you know. Okay, I know I'm... I'm you uh, promised us to yes, keep your yeah, question yeah, yeah, short. Oh, it's very <laughs> so. brief for me, believe me. Okay, so uh, my question is this. Uh, basically, do we see a solution in a solid edu education system? And if yes, then what it should be like? Thank you. Uh, so the question about Scotland and these secessionist movements. Um, so I think one uh, fact about democratic theory is that it gives you no guidance uh, as to what the boundaries of citizenship should be. There's just no theory about this. You know, why should the United States stop at the Mexican border as opposed to, you know, absorbing Mexico if it wants to come in? Uh, and de facto, uh, actual nation states are formed as a result of coercion, accident, uh, and you know, since the rise of modern nationalism, uh, usually on some kind of a cultural principle, but that's just not fixed, and, and there are a lot of pragmatic issues that get into it uh, as well. So I suspect that both Catalonia and Scotland uh, can think of seceding, 
in a way only because uh, Europe is integrated economically and they don't have to actually worry about impoverishing themselves by cutting themselves off from the rest uh, of Europe and it becomes a kind of cultural game for them that they can preserve you know, language and traditions but nothing else in life changes. They're still democracies, they're still defended from you know, outside forces uh, and so forth. Uh, and so I don't think it says much if Scotland you know, secedes. Iraq, I mean, there's many, many sources of failure. Among those, I think George W. Bush is much, much more to blame than Obama. Um, the question of whether you can have it all is a very complicated one. I think the truth of the matter is, is if you look really hard at historical cases of development, things were sequenced and they took a very long time and there was not you know, I've got this phrase, getting to Denmark, because everybody wants to be like Denmark, which has got everything going, going for it simultaneously. Denmark did not get to be Denmark all at once. You know, that's just a fact of life, and it is discouraging, but I think sometimes, as a matter of development strategy, you do have to, uh, you know, you do have to think about uh, a certain degree of sequencing, because it's just hard to uh, do everything uh, at once. I'm not quite sure whether I understood your the direction of your question about education. I mean, I think education is important in several specific respects. So, you know, as a general social matter, middle classes are important you know, as a support for democracy. And I actually would define um, a middle class much more by the level of their education rather than by, you know, income. And so in that respect, uh, it's important education is also important you know in terms of uh, uh, quality of state capacity because that's one of the definitions of a you know of a modern uh, bureaucracy and you can't do state reform unless you actually also reform the education uh, system I, one thing that uh, that is necessary to be in the game on democratic development, on rule of law development, uh, is economic growth and development. Uh, uh, without economic growth and, and development, there isn't much of a game. Dem in uh, democracy promotion, you get into the politics of scarcity, and those politics of scarcity are really counter to uh, uh, democratic development. Uh, so, and uh, uh, likewise in, in rule of law, uh, uh, that's what I was trying to indicate in my, my, my talk, that uh, rule of law becomes uh, much more consequential and much more demand-driven at later stages of uh, uh, development. Uh, you know, uh, six, seven, eight thousand uh, dollars GDP, things happen because uh, economic constituencies are one of the biggest drivers of the development of uh, rule of law. And uh, when the economy becomes more uh, complex, uh, legal institutions tend to be in uh, greater demand. Um, uh, we see even in, in, in China corporate law development uh, uh, because of the demands of a, of a growing economy. And I happen to think that uh, China is a very dynamic rule of law place, even though it doesn't have the ultimate things that Professor Fukuyama would look at, uh, you know, uh, the uh, rule of law constraining the excesses of the executive or the party. It doesn't have that yet, but it does have a lot of other things that are going on that will contribute to the ultimate development of rule of law. So economic development is uh, really important. Unfortunately, there's a lot we don't know about sequencing. Uh, and, uh, but at Earlier stages of development, I'm much more confident about my advice than uh, uh, at later stages of uh, uh, development, mi uh, middle income uh, melu. I want to give you an example of going to a very rudimentary country and giving some very rudimentary advice and having it rejected. So I, I went to Afghanistan shortly after the fall of the Taliban, and I met with a, a head of a development agency uh, at, at the end of my, my time there, and he said, so Eric, what should, we, uh, what should we do? I said, we need to figure out what's been going on for the last 30 years in, in, in Afghanistan, do some basic empirical research to figure out where dis what kind of disputes have arisen, where people have gone to resolve those disputes, and what their level of satisfaction is. Most of all of this was done outside of the courts. And uh, he said, well, that sounds fancy. I said, no, it's very, uh, very basic. 
And he, I said, so what, what's your great idea? And he said, well, a group of city bankers uh, just came through, and we know how well Citibank was governed at that time. Uh, and uh, they said, uh, Afghanistan needs a commercial code. And I said, Craig, if everything goes right in Afghanistan for the next 10 years, there'll be some small aspects of a commercial code that might be useful. But it, Afghanistan needs a commercial code like it needs a hole in the head right now. And his response was, yes, but we can have a commercial code drafted before the Afghans have their pencil sharpened. And unfortunately, it's that sort of nonsensical ideas on, on, on sequencing that are just wrong. But on, at, at a, a, a later stage of development, the, the advice becomes uh, much, much more textured. Uh, but I don't think it's all hopeless. As long as you've got economic development, you've got, you've got a dog in the game. Uh, uh, some years ago, a Palestinian delegation came to me and said, what can we do to strengthen the rule of law? I said, your economy's contracted 30% over the last four years. Poverty rates have increased by 20%. There is no game. So economic growth and development is, is foundational to a lot of you know, uh, political and legal development. And just a couple of last uh, statements. I was not asked about that. I just still I want to answer about why Scots can vote and Catalonians cannot, uh, because there are two things that are missing. First, there is no world government, uh, and there is only British government and Spanish government, and they have different opinions. And second, because there is no universal social theory or political theory which can solve all issues. So that's why there is no single standard for everybody and uh, life is not perfect. And that uh, brings me to the second uh, kind of, crit it was not criticism question rather than criticism by Mariam, I guess, uh, that there is another Weberian distinction bet uh, apart from what we spoke about. Uh, on the one hand, there is kind of prescriptive and normative thinking and on the other hand, there is science which tries to understand, uh, you know, how, how society and political systems work. and. Of course, uh, why cannot, uh, especially when you talk to about democracy, it's very hard to distinguish fully uh, among those things, but to some extent uh, we have to. I mean, uh, we have to admit that all things don't always come together, and if we, that's uh, what evidence, historical evidence and empirical evidence shows, that there are some contradictions in such wonderful things as, as democracy and state and economic development, we cannot say we should not admit that there are uh, uh, such contradictions just because we fear that some young politicians may be become misguided. I don't think that autocratic politicians are autocratic because they read wrong social theory, <laughs> 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 frankly, so that is not the main reason. Thank you. Okay. Um, just to <laughs> conclude um, our... Um, <laughs> session, I would like to thank our distinguished guests and speakers. I would like to thank uh, the audience for the active participation. Uh, I think we had a very interesting um, discussion with some very controversial conclusions. <laughs> so with this, um, I would like to wish all of you good luck. Thanks. Thanks for participating. Well, thank you for moderating.